today we are very grateful that dilip simian professor dilip simian accepted our invitation to speak on mahatma gandhi's last struggle and thanks to anhat for this kind invitation and opportunity to speak on this subject the subject of gandhi's last fast and his last struggle is vast and complex and it is connected to many other issues including the final politics of partition and independence the high politics that took place uh, and many other these issues are very controversial and they remain controversial they should be discussed however my focus today shall be in the time that we have will be on the struggle that he launched vis-a-vis -vis the indian people to calm down the atmosphere to reduce the level of violence and hatred his last struggle to bring about some degree of amity and communal harmony in the country at a time of great strife and great violence it is now almost 69 years to the day that he started his last fast that was on the 13th and uh, he ended it on the 18th so i will focus as i said on uh, on his struggle to reestablish communal communal harmony and the, and the style of politics that he adopted or the style that he adopted to talk to the people these are themes which for me are absolutely foremost in trying to understand the significance of gandhi it's a tragedy that in our country uh, there is so much misunderstanding about gandhi and that he has been subjected to so much opprobrium and slander that we fail to give credit to such a great man and uh, fail to even realize what he done we, we don't even know the facts it will be a long time before all these facts come to light and it depends upon us we are living through a very grievous time in the world and uh, as you can see after he died uh, all the world over there was a great tide tidal wave of sorrow Louis Fisher one of the journalists who wrote a book about him also said in in America that uh, just an old man in a loin cloth in far away india but when he died the whole world wept i will read out some of those passages to you also but before that i should say that these are themes that have interested me for many years long before i became an academic or a teacher or studied anything even in my childhood because as it happens and this is my personal some personal observations um, as it happens uh, my father was an arm, one one of the few indian army officers in fort william in 1946 during what is called the great calcutta killing he was present in the in in the army he was uh, one of the three indian army officers in fort william and he observed the whole thing at close quarters what was going on and he told me all my childhood i have been hearing about this what took place in calcutta um, it is a really grievous descriptions that i heard uh, and apparently in those days i mean after three days he managed to get out of fort william and when he went back home to my mother who was by herself for three days he said that the whole city was shattered and there were dead bodies lying everywhere dangling from the rooftops and so on and when he reached a certain place which is a, a college area of st paul's um, the the students were crying all the national sentiments had gone students were crying and appealing to the british soldiers to save them hearing this description for many years and that's when my interest grew as a child i had no idea of politics or anything like that and one other thing i remember was that my parents this is before i was born were traveling from delhi to dehradun where they were to take up a job um on 30th of january 1948 in the dehradun express and that train was delayed by 6 hours and when they reached they didn't know what is happening when they reached uh, dehradun uh, they were met by an old teacher of my father's who was teaching in the royal indian rashtriya indian military college rmc 
who met them at the plat <coughs> platform and, and as soon as he saw them, he burst into tears. And he said that they've killed him. So for me, it is something that is, uh, has always been very emotional uh, because uh, I always heard from my parents that he was a real great man. And subsequently, I began to hear all kind of radical critiques and began to study the details. Uh, but I must say that we only become aware of such gr the greatness of such people in a moment of extreme crisis. Otherwise, we don't care. So I will go into this in a little more detail. The Delhi Declaration of 1948 is, of course, something that is a very important document, but uh, we have all forgotten it. But I, I'll lead up to it. Um, briefly, the situation began to deteriorate in India with the phenomenon which is called the Great Calcutta Killing of 1946, which took place uh, on 16th of August and from 16th to about the 20th of August 1946, sorry, um, there took place uh, a mass riot in the city of Calcutta. Uh, and this was a Muslim League government led by the Chief Minister Hussain Shahid Shurawardi. And of course there is a big debate about it and uh, there is no time to go into that debate as to what were the possible reasons for this and who was mainly responsible, etc. Of course, there is a lot of partisanship and uh, nobody immediately afterwards could agree as to who was responsible. But uh, the Congress blamed the Muslim League and said the Muslim League was in charge of the government. The Muslim League said this was an attempt by the Congress to punish the Muslim League for the demand for Pakistan, etc. But as it happened, this was the only Muslim League governed state in the country and they were launching a protest, uh, uh, a civil protest in an administration that was controlled by them. Uh, so of course some of the responsibility must devolve uh, around Shurovar these shoulders. But whatever it is, anything between five to ten thousand people were killed and of course they were all poor people. And this killing uh, was very, very brutal. Um, uh, which, and, uh, people were dismembered, beheaded, and of course the poorest people were hit. The gundas were let loose. Um, and uh, this was a shock. And after this, <coughs> the cycle of violence began to spread. It spread to Dhaka. After that, it spread to Noakhali. It was alleged that in Calcutta, the Muslims had, had got the uh, raw end of the deal and uh, revenge had to be taken. So in East Bengal districts, the cry went up, uh, take revenge for Calcutta. And there were uh, riots in Dhaka. Then there was, of course, Noakhali, which began in, uh, in October, November, uh, October rather, 1946. Then after that, it spread to, uh, uh, to Bihar. There was mass rioting in Bihar, in, in, whereas in Bengal, it was limited to two major districts, Noakhali and Tipara. In Bihar, it spread to many, many more districts, and there was large-scale uh, murder, and there was a Congress government in charge over there. After that, it spread to Delhi, it spread to Punjab. So, it may be fair to say that the cycle of violence that began with Calcutta just carried on until the actual partition riots took place, and even after that. So, this is the period in which Gandhi began his work. And he was, remember, fairly isolated from the high politics this time because he was spending more time with the people. He was not spending, of course, the high leadership was wanting to consult him and calling upon him and sending messages to him and, and so on, but he was spending all his time with the common people. Uh, itself, it is an indication of the character of the man that at a time of this great crisis, political crisis, independence of India, he was not so much interested in the high politics uh, of the country as in what was the pain of the, of the suffering uh, masses. He went to Noakhali where a large number, tens of thousands of uh, Hindus in villages uh, uh, surrounded by uh, Muslim villages were being uh, uh, dealt with in the most horrendous manner. There was terrible communal riots inspired by one person who had been an ex-member of the Bengal Legislative Assembly, a Muslim leaguer. 
and uh, there were really horrendous things that took place including mass abduction, molestation of women, um, uh, there were places where women were forced to observe the murder of their husbands and then forced to con get converted and marry the persons who had done the murders, etc, etc. There were terrible scenes. And this was all done in the name of revenge for what had happened in Calcutta. So uh, Gandhi decided to go there. Of course, he took the permission of the administration. Shuravardi was, and Shuravardi was very, uh, very uh, suspicious of what he was doing. Even Fazlul Haq and all made some sarcastic comments about Gandhi's visit to Noakhali. And he went there with a troop of people. And he began to stay, select certain villages, and walk around those villages, trying to bring about peace. And of course. His main concern was to um, tell people that whatever is being done in the name of Islam is not really Islam, it's all politics and they should not do this, etc, etc. So he was trying to calm the souls and calm people who were absolutely desperate with, with grief. Um, <clears throat> my title of my talk is Love at Work and what I want to say is However, briefly, we will have to go into it in much greater detail whenever you have time. But what I want to say is that his style of work was always to do public service. For example, he would take a whole medical troop with him. There was Sushila Pai, who was a, who was a doctor, and other people. He would take this whole team of people. They would try to set up dispensaries. In fact, there were some places where they were even giving medical treatment to rioters, people who had gone somewhere to kill someone and got injured in the process. He was even, they were giving medical treatment to those kind of people. Uh, there are many instances, there are many, many in interesting instances of what took place in, uh, in Noakhali. The fact is that he stayed there from, uh, from, a, from uh, uh, November right up to January, February with, with gaps. He would go and come. But he had established headquarters in many, many villages, and his small troop of people, and he was carrying out this public service. Of course, he would do regular prayer ceremonies. And in this prayer, what he did, the pravachan, which was known as. And in the pravachan, he would always read out texts from all the religious uh, holy books, including the Quran. I mean, he would make a, he would make a habit of um, starting or ending most of these prayer sabhas with uh, Surah Al-Fatiha. And uh, this was his habit uh, to try to bring about unity among the people. Some of the stories from there are of interest. I mean, there's much else that can be said, and I will read out to you some of them. Um, uh, one was that uh, uh, while he was walking through some of these villages, uh, there was a dog, a Tibetan spaniel dog, which was following him and following the troop and turning around, looking at him and, and proceeding. And some of his followers wanted to shoo away the dog. This is a story related by Narayan Bhai Desai. Um, and uh, in this book, My Life is My Message, the fourth volume of his uh, wonderful biography of Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, Gandhi said, no, this dog is trying to tell us something. And because the dog seemed very worried. And he said, let us follow him. And he went with the dog and the dog went to a certain hut and he began to dig and uncovered the bones and dead bodies of his masters, his human family. And Gandhiji said that, see, you know, even animals, even the dogs, kutte bhi wafadar hain, lekin insan wafadar hai Even the dogs are loyal, but we have forgotten what it means to be human. You know? So this is just one of the stories from there. Um, there is another which is very, very interesting. One of his uh, followers, Bibi Abdus Salam, uh, she was, uh, a, she was a, a Punjabi Muslim, she was a staunch follower of Gandhi and uh, she accompanied him on this trip and she played a big role in the prayer meetings. She would attend all the prayer meetings and uh, in one of these, and, and many, in, the, in these prayer meetings she would convince all, the, all those present that forced conversion was not permissible and uh, she enabled many Hindu women who had been forcibly converted to, to, go, to go back in, uh, to their ancestral faith and uh, become Hindus again. So this is the kind of work he would do. Bibi Amtus Salam was also involved in a very interesting episode which she has written about. 
in one village where three uh, sacred weapons, swords, from a Hindu temple had been seized, had been stolen during the mob rioting and so on. And in this, um, she did her best to get them back. And finally, she went on fast. She went to that village and she went on fast and she insisted with the Malvi who had taken it away that he has to return them. And she finally succeeded in doing so. But what is very interesting is a little statement issued uh, by the Muslims, uh, local Muslims of that village. It's called uh, uh, Sirandi village. With God as witness, we solemnly declare that we bear no antagonism towards the Hindus or members of any other community. To each one, to whatever faith he might belong, his religion is as dear as Islam is to us. There can therefore be no question of interference by anybody in the observance of the religious practices of others. We understand the Bibi, Bibi Amtus Salam's object is the establishment of Hindu-Muslim unity. The object is gained by the signing of this pledge. We wish therefore that she should give up her fast. We realize that if we are found to have acted with any mental reservations, in that this matter we shall have to face a past on Gandhiji's part. Our endeavor for the recovery of the remaining sword shall continue. So this is just one of the examples. Uh, let me also say that members of the uh, Indian National Army were also present there helping Gandhi in, this, in, in his uh, work in, in, in Bengal. Um, this was what happened in Noakhali. Thereafter, Gandhi uh, went to Bihar. While in Noakhali, he was repeatedly being taunted by the local Muslim League leaders and because it was a Muslim League government, the government tried to put many obstacles in his path. At every step, he would, be, however, remain in communication with uh, Suravardi and tell him that uh, I will, whatever I am doing, I will be your helper and, uh, uh, and you can, uh, I don't need any police protection or anything. He was directly uh, interacting with people. Many places he had to face a lot of hatred. People would throw fecal matter or broken glass at his feet and he would face it. What is really astonishing is the equanimity with which he faced so much hostility. Anyway, it's a, it's a very interesting story. I'm just very briefly covering it. Thereafter, he was told, he was asked by Dr. Sayyid Mahmood of the Bihar Congress to visit Bihar because over there, the Muslim population has been subjected to terrible communal rioting and people, Hindu Mahasabha and others taking revenge in the name of uh, taking revenge for what is called, called what happened in Noakhali had become a, had begun a cycle of vengeful killings in Bihar and that has spread in, in more than one district and Gandhi was very ashamed he said this is a terrible thing that has happened it's the Congress government which is in power obviously the Congress government has also failed however when he went there he had more sympathy because the, the, the government and the senior officials and leaders were of course all followers of his. So when he arrived uh, uh, in early March, March 1947, he arrived in, uh, in uh, Bihar and he said that Bihar is my Karbala. People say that Gandhi uses Hindu metaphors but he equally used Muslim metaphors. He said Bihar is my Karbala and uh, I have to see to it that this stops. And uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, among the first things that he said to uh, Abdul Bari and, uh, and uh, Sayyid Mahmood, he laughed in a bitter way and said, so you are still alive. And then he began his pravachans and so on in Bihar as well. He set up a Muslim relief fund and for the Muslim, and he, wherever he went, he would ask people to donate money to that. There was one case where a blind beggar came <coughs> for miles and miles to come to him and give him Foreigners. And he said that this foreigners for me is worth four crores, you know, because and this man is a poor man. And so in many, many places, this is the kind of thing that would happen. Uh, we, I mean, there are various stories about uh, uh, the activity that he engaged in. Shanawaz Khan of the Indian National Army was also present in Bihar and was helping him out. And... Um, uh, I just want to uh, give you some examples of uh, the impact that he had. Uh, in one place he was criticized for using his pravachans uh, for doing, uh, for, for disseminating his political ideas. So this age-old controversy about religion and politics, 
keep religion and politics separate. Let's be very clear that for Gandhi that was ridiculous. For him, religion and politics were linked together. That's because for him, religion was a source of moral authority. It wasn't a pursuit of power. It was a source of philosophical knowledge. So he said, I speak of political matters in a religious spirit. A person who leads a religious life cannot divide it into different compartments. Indeed, it might even be said that the law which held together the universe was indistinguishable from the lawmaker. Speaking in human language, one might go so far as to say that for God himself was subject to the law, to the wheel of law. Anyway, um, among the things that happened there was, but here's Pyare Lal describing what happened in some of these uh, prayer meetings. And he would end the prayer meeting by asking people to donate money for Muslim Relief Fund. The crowd was so big and there was such a big rush that it was feared that many would be crushed. It was a touching sight to see men, women and children, in spite of jostling and pushing, make their way steadily towards Gandhiji. <coughs> Old women untying a copper from the corner of their tattered sarees to hand over to him with trembling hands and glistening eyes. That evening's collection came to nearly 2,000 rupees. This is just one little story. Uh, there was a letter placed in his hands. This is all the poor people, mind you. These are, these are not high, uh, high intellectuals or leaders. A letter placed in his hands during the pilgrimage of the Bihar villages. This is one small village called Andari village. Revered Bapu, at your sacred feet, we of Andari and surrounding villages declare with God as witness that we are extremely sorry for what has happened. The occasion which has brought you here and which has caused you so much pain is a matter of shame for us. We swear before you that we of Andari and the surrounding villages will henceforth regard the Muslims as our blood brothers, as we used to do before the unfortunate occurrence. For the sin we have committed, we beg your and God's pardon. This is just one of the letters. There were many other such things. So this is Gandhi in Bihar um, in the aftermath of this um, crisis. And let me say that he managed somehow to calm down the atmosphere wherever he went. It did happen. Um, uh, this is a very brief coverage of these things. Uh, but thereafter, he went, uh, uh, he was in Delhi. And in Delhi, there was the Asia conference where people from all over Asia had come in April. And here, again, there was the situation where he used to stay in the Bhangi, uh, Bhangi Basti and he would hold his Pravachan Sabhas. And there were instances here because there were a large number of refugees from Punjab. They had come, Hindus and Sikhs from Punjab. The atmosphere was in Delhi was absolutely murderous. You know, it was full of grief. And um, of course, the Punjab rioting had not yet reached its uh, apogee. This is only April 47. Uh, it, by, by, in another few months, it would become even worse. But, uh, uh, in these meetings, for instance, th there are very, very interesting uh, accounts of, the, of these meetings. But whenever he would go to, uh, to, to the Pravachan Sabha, he would start with the Buddhist mantra, then he would read out the first verse of Isha Upanishad, then he, there would be uh, uh, sections from the Gita's second dis discourse about the, the notion of Sthita Pragya. And then, of course, he would go to Surah Al-Fateha. And when he started reading out Surah Al-Fatiha, uh, there would be objection. And there was one famous case in which there was objection for three days running. People, young men, uh, would, and they were from Hindu Mahasabha and RSS. In fact, there was one instance in which only two people were objecting. But Gandhi said, if even a child objects, I'm not going to proceed with the prayer meeting. So for three days he was forced not to say his prayers, and he would say, "If you, if you, and in the in the first day, people, his followers tried to crush those boys. He said, "You do not crush them. If they are objecting, let, let them object." But it's very interesting what the, the some of the things he said. Uh, he said the the, the, uh, the young man said that this temple belongs to the public, and we have seen what has happened in the Punjab. We will not allow you. And then Gandhi said. This temple belongs to the Bhangis, and I too am a Bhangi. You know, all those who go on about Gandhi and what he wrote about Bhangis should remember that he declared himself, he, he had been actually cleaning fecal matter since the 1890s. And by the, the upper caste of India really considered him to be an outcast. 
he declared it in so many words. And he said, I have been cleaning night, night, soil, night soil for many years. So I am also a bhangi and it's my right to carry out my prayers over here. Anyway, this, um, uh, this disruption continued for, for, for many days and on the fourth day only he was allowed. And uh, it was a Hindu Mahasabha person who said, now we have stopped him for, for so many days, but we should allow him to say his prayers. And he was allowed to say his prayers. Now this would, this seems to be very eccentric. In the middle of rioting, partition of the country, break up of society, disintegration of the state structure, this man is sitting in a basti and uh, trying to read out passages from various different um, religious texts. So it would seem that it's a very odd and eccentric thing to do. I think we should try to understand that what he was doing is trying to touch the hearts of the people. He was trying to show them that there is nothing in their religious beliefs that should cause them to hate each other at something else. So he was talking to people in a way that he was trying to make them understand that uh, it's all in their hands. It's all in their, whatever is happening in society is in the control of the public and how they think and relate to one another. So these are just some examples uh, as a background to what took place later. And uh, what took place later is uh, the uh, his, his 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 visit to uh, Calcutta, and after that his his visit to to Delhi. Uh, a full year after the Calcutta riots of 1946, the situation in Calcutta had not improved. That means over the course of the year, the things that I have been describing, the situation in Calcutta uh, kept simmering. There were repeated riots. Not two or three days would pass before there would be riots again. Uh, the people were living in a climate of fear. And it is in this situation that Gandhiji decided to be in Calcutta on the occasion of independence. Actually, uh, 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 it's quite remarkable that his presence in Calcutta caused such a situation that Independence took place in a scenario of extreme communal harmony, fraternizing and even brotherly love between people. And Eid was celebrated in in middle of August uh, with scenes of fraternization between Hindus and Muslims even though the country was being partitioned. And people remarked on this. But he said that I don't think this may last. Uh, it may not last. He remained there. And sure enough, towards the end of August 1947, in Calcutta, um, uh, the rioting began again. And at that point, uh, he was due to leave for Delhi, but Shurabarti and all requested him to remain in Calcutta. And then he said that I'll remain provided you come and stay with me and we will go to a Muslim Basti and lived there. He went to a place called Hyderi Mansion in Beliaghata and he and Shuravardi said we will both we will both remain here. And Rajendra Prashad is reported to have written that uh, Sardar Patel, that strange company you are keeping nowadays. You know? So of course Shuravardi was hated among the Hindu population of Calcutta for being the author of the Calcutta riots. Whether or not that is true is a, is, a, is another matter, but he was hated. And Gandhi said, declared that Shuravati is my friend. And he was physically attacked. There were gundas who came while they were sitting there. He was even physically attacked. The blow was warded off by a young girl who was sitting next to him. And he did not flinch. So he sat there unprotected by police or anyone with hooligans and gundas milling around. And he said, I have to face them. And he faced them. And they said that, you know, this Shuravati, how dare you defend them? He actually defended Shuravati. And uh, then began uh, his decision, he took a decision, he said that this situation is getting from bad to worse, it might explode again. People were fearful because Calcutta had not seen peace for the whole year. And then he decided on the 1st of September 1947 to go on his fast. And he went on that fast and for the first day of course it continued. Uh, but soon after that, um, Within two days, the situation began to change. And uh, Omyo Chakravarti, who used to be a secretary to Rabindranath Tagore at one point, he was an eyewitness to what took place in Calcutta. And uh, he, 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 he even wrote about it. And uh, 
I'll just read out a few things. It's very interesting what he wrote. Um, he says that at the time of the cruel communal massacre of Calcutta, the trial that he underwent in an old decrepit house devoid of any security, when people killed each other all around him, was clear and unambiguous. To atone for it, Gandhiji resolved to undergo a fiery ordeal through his withered body. Everyone recognized that in a few days, the bodily pain that he would experience would become suffering that would increase at every moment. His body cells would die and turn to poison. Approaching death would bring with it unbearable physical suffering. But the millions fully recognized his suffering. They might object to his methods, may not have faith in his means, but still they would have only one question. How is Gandhiji? People became restless. Be that a butcher's son, a rickshaw puller, an office clerk or school going student. All day long they would listen to the radio news and feel one with Gandhiji's ordeal. I recall students of the university coming to seek leave of absence. They were all ill at ease, perturbed. They did not know what to do. In response to the question, why are you so worried? They would, they would say that though they did not believe in the means he had adopted, they had faith in the philosophy behind the means. Anyway, uh, those who sought the promise of ending the fast in exchange of guns and knives, Gandhi asked why. Because during this period, while he was on fast, within a day or two, the top leaders of Bengal were coming to see him and appealing to him. And he would turn them away. And then, there was even an occasion when hooligans came with their arms and Gandhi said, this is the first time I am seeing a Sten gun. And they threw it. It came in that film, uh, Attenborough's film on Gandhi. It is shown in that film, but it is true. People, hooligans who had actually killed people came to Gandhi and said, we can take the blame for anything, but we cannot uh, take the blame for your death. And they threw the guns there uh, at his feet. And Gandhi said, I want you all to sign that if there is any further violence in Cal Calcutta, you, the top leaders, you will be responsible. All right? He said, people would always say gundas. And his famous words were that gundas do not spring from the sky. We are the people who maintain the gundas. So do not blame everything on gundas and hooligans. It is us who are nurturing the gundas. And we, we have to make a decision, conscious decision. So. Towards the end, people would return home at the end of a day. This is Omeo uh, Chakravarti continuing. And, and, and they would find the food cooked and ready to be served. They would realize that the women of the house had not eaten. They would reply that, how can we eat when Gandhiji is dying for us, our sins? They could not comprehend this. What is the source of this sorrow that engulfs the city? How did it work on the people? The numbed minds were awakened. They began to experience pain. All citizens of the city felt pain. <coughs> Gandhiji knew well when the healing would commence. At the root was the joy of togetherness. Sensitivity did not mean the experience of pain. At the root was the joy of togetherness. It was the realization of joint responsibility. It's very remarkable that even the Anglo-Indian and English police officers of, this, of the city were wearing black armbands uh, in sympathy with Gandhi. And the editor of The Statesman, who had always insisted on referring to him as Mr. Gandhi, declared in an editorial that we will now call him Mahatma. This is in September 1947. So this was what C.R. Rajagopalachari called the miracle of Calcutta. And uh, Gandhi himself commented on it. He said, is this to be called a miracle or an accident? By whatever name it may be described, it is clear that all the credit being given to me is, is, is undeserved, nor is it deserved by Shahid Sahib. This sudden upheaval is not the work of one or two men. We are toys in the hand of God. So he persisted with his belief in God in the midst of all this. He makes us dance to his tune. The utmost that man can do is refrain from interfering in the, with that dance, and he should render full obedience to his maker's will. So this was Calcutta in 1947. Thereafter, Gandhi came to Delhi. And as you know, the situation in Delhi was so horrible. Uh, the refugees had come from, from Punjab and they were in a, in, a, in, a, in a crazy state of grief. 
and uh, the Muslim population from Mewat had been forced to run away. They were taking refuge in the Purana Kila. Uh, and Kingsway camp was full of refugees from Punjab. So the whole city was plunged in grief and turmoil. And then he decided he was incidentally at this point he was due to go to Punjab. He was on his route, on his way to Punjab. Uh, I may remark that uh, uh, Lord Mountbatten had sent him a telegram at the time of his Calcutta fast say, saying that in Punjab we have 55,000 troops to maintain law and order and we have failed. And let me salute you as a one-man boundary force in Bengal for preventing riots. So he was on his way to Punjab and the aim was to take a kafila of Hindus and Sikhs back to Punjab, to their homes, who had run away, and to bring a kafila of Muslims who had run away from India back to their homes. So this was his aim. But when he came to Delhi, he decided that he could not leave. And this is his the final fast, which everybody wrongfully says it's because of returning 55 crores to Pakistan. This is not true. All right. This was only one of the issues that had arisen. Of course it was an issue, but that's not, that was not the reason that he, he went on the fast. He went on the fast to re-establish communal harmony in the country. He said Delhi is the capital of India. If this kind continues in, in Delhi, then the whole country will disintegrate. And he said, I will, I will not let that happen. So along with that, the fact is that he remained in Delhi from uh, September 1947 until his death. All right. So his plan for going to Punjab was postponed indefinitely. And as it happened, he could never undertake it. Who knows what would have happened had he actually gone. Uh, but he noted what is happening in Delhi. And in the course of that, he made a statement. Um, he said, this is in December, uh, 70, uh, 22nd of December 1947. He made a very interesting, important statement. He said, some eight or ten miles from here at Meroli, there is a shrine of Kutubuddin Bhaktiar Chishti, esteemed as second only to Ajmer. It is visited every year, not only by Muslims, but by thousands of non-Muslims. Last September, the shrine was subjected to the wrath of Hindu mobs. The Muslims living in the vicinity of the shrine for last 800 years had to leave their homes. I mention this sad episode to tell you that though Muslims love the shrine, Today, no Muslim can be found anywhere near it. It is the duty of the Hindus, Sikhs and then the officials and the government to open the shrine again and to wash this stain off us. The same applies to other shrines and religious places of Muslims in and around Delhi. The time has come when both India and Pakistan must unequivocally declare to the majorities in each country that they will not tolerate desecration of religious places, be they small or big, and they should also undertake to repair the places damaged during the riots. So this was his declaration at the end of December. The fast that he undertook is a fast for the purpose of returning this shrine as, along with more than a hundred other mosques in Delhi to the Muslims and to bring about peace and communal harmony uh, in Delhi. And uh, uh, Oves has described a little bit about uh, what happened there were demonstrations, there were large numbers of refugees who said let Gandhi die, Gandhi Murdabad, but also at the same time, he was in, in this, uh, what is now Gandhi Smriti, it was the Bidla house. And uh, every day he would still take his pravachan, and in the pravachan would still proceed in the same way with prayers and so on. And however, he also would say something about communal harmony and so on. Let me just uh, digress a little bit. Some years ago, I was asked to write an essay on Gandhi uh, for, for undergraduate students. And uh, I began to write the essay and I found that uh, it is just turning about, out to be just another run-of-the-mill academic essay and I didn't want that. I just decided on the spur of the moment to begin reading what Gandhi was saying in the last few months of his life right, say from November, December, or October, November 1947 until 1948. And mind you, all this material is available. It's easily available, we just need a fingertip. We don't bother, that's our fault. When I began to read it, I suddenly felt that this man is talking to me. 
because he seemed to be aware of his impending death. He was saying everything that he wanted to say about Indian society, all the problems of Indian society, he seemed to be saying it. About language, about casteism, about violence, about communalism, about every issue, about education, about women. He raised all these issues. And all you have to do is read it. It's available in uh, volume 90 of the Gandhi Collected Works. It's there on Gandhi Heritage Portal. It's very simple. It's available in Gujarati, Hindi and English. Please read it just as a tribute to the man. But, uh, it, as I said, it's quite evident from his last utterances that he was using this as an opportunity to leave. It's, it's like a testament. It seemed to me that what Gandhi was saying in this period was his last testament to the Indian people. And I assure you, if you read it, you will see how vibrant and dynamic it is for us today. It's 70 years old, but it's still as vibrant and dynamic and as relevant for us today. If only we bother to read it. Uh, he was addressing all these issues. Anyway, so what happened during these few days is that he would carry, out, carry on his dialogue with people, but he was getting weaker and weaker. And... Uh, uh, he raised many issues including there was one issue in which some Sikhs were very upset by his comments about uh, you know how, how, how they have been uh, uh, they have been abusing their own uh, religious tenets by engaging in violence and he said I have not read Guru Granth Sahib to please you I have read Guru Granth Sahib to gain knowledge for myself and he said nowhere have I found in Guru Granth Sahib that you can attack an innocent person and finally, when the, when the peace was attained, he said, now I can say Vaheguru. So he was very, very attuned to all the religious sentiments of everybody present. And he would talk like a grandfather was talking to his grandchildren. He said, you don't have to tell me about religion. I know better about your religion than, I, than even you do. All right? So this was the atmosphere. There was a lot of hatred. But at the same time, there was also a movement building up, you know, that we have to stop this, you know. And it did happen. Uh, there were meetings addressed. I mean, Maulana Zad was addressing public meetings. So was uh, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. And in these meetings, more and more people were beginning to realize what Gandhiji was saying. And again, it did happen. He did manage to bring about a change. And this document is the result of that change. And this is what I read out to you. It's a seven-point declaration witnessed by the top leaders uh, of, the, of the country as well as by leaders of the RSS and Hindu, Hindu Mahasabha and uh, uh, I'll read out what the, what the declaration is and then I'll read out to you what Gandhiji himself said. The declaration is issued on 18th of January 1948. So we, we should try to popularize the declaration. We should let people know because it's a very important document in the history of modern India. We wish to announce that it is our heartfelt desire that Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs and members of the other communities should once again live in Delhi like brothers and in perfect amity and we take the pledge that we shall protect the life, property and faith of Muslims and that the incidents which have taken place in Delhi will not happen again. We want to assure Gandhiji that the annual fair at Khwaja Kutubuddin Mazar will be held this year as in the previous years. Muslims will be free to move about in Sabzi Mandi, Karol Bagh, Pahadganj and other localities just as they could in the past. The mosques which have been left by Muslims and which are now in the possession of Hindus and Sikhs will be returned. The areas which have been set apart for Muslims will not be forcibly occupied. We shall not object to the return to Delhi of the Muslims who have, been migrate, who have migrated from here if they choose to come back and Muslims shall be able to carry on their business as before. We assure that all these things will be done by our personal effort and not with the help of the police or the military. We request Mahatma Ji to believe us and to give up his fast and to continue to lead us. As he, has, as he has done hitherto. Then Gandhiji made this declaration, his own speech. He was very weak. Uh, he made this speech. He was saying, I am happy to hear what you have told me, but if you, have, if you have overlooked one point, all this will be worth nothing. If this declaration means that you will safeguard Delhi and whatever happens outside Delhi will be no concern to you, you will be committing a, a grave error and it will be sheer foolishness on my part to break my fast. You must have seen the press reports of the happenings in Allahabad. If not, look them up. I understand that the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh and the Hindu Mahasabha are among the signatories to this declaration. This will, it will amount to a breach of faith on their part 
if they hold themselves responsible for peace in Delhi but not in other places. I have been observing that this sort of deception is being practiced in the country these days on a large scale. Delhi is the heart of India, the capital of India. The leaders from the whole of India have assembled here. Men have become like beasts. But if those who are assembled here who constitute the cream among men can make the whole of India understand that Hindus, Muslims and followers of other religions are like brothers, if they cannot make them understand, it bodes ill for both the dominions. What will be the fate of India if we continue to quarrel with one another? Let us take no step that may become a cause for repentance later. Situation demands the highest courage from all of us. We have to consider whether or not we can accomplish what we are going to promise. If you are not con confident of fulfilling the pledge, uh, do not ask me to give up my fast. All right. Then he carries on, what greater folly can there be than to claim that Hindustan is for only for Hindus and Pakistan is for Muslims alone? The refugees here should realize that things in Pakistan will be set right by the example set in Delhi. Whatever therefore you do, do after careful thought and consideration. My Muslim friends meet me frequently and assure me that peaceful atmosphere has been restored in Delhi. If these friends have any misgivings in their heart and feel that they have to perforce stay here as they have nowhere else to go, then uh, let me admit, admit it frankly, they will have to part company. But I am an optimist. I, once I resolve to do something, I refuse to accept defeat. Then he carries on, today you show me that Hindus and Muslims have become one, but if Hindus can continue to regard Muslims as Yamanas and Asuras, incapable of realizing God, and Muslims regard Hindus likewise, it will be the worst sort of blasphemy. A Muslim friend presented me with a book in Patna. Its author is an eminent Muslim. The book says, God ordains that a Kafir and a Hindu is a Kafir is worse than a poisonous creature. He should be exterminated. It is one's duty to be treacherous to him. Why should one treat him with any courtesy? If Muslims harboring such thoughts uh, assure Hindus about their good behavior, they will only be deceiving Hindus. If you betray one, you betray all. If I truly worship a stone image, I deceive no one. I feel that if hearts of both Hindus and Muslims are full of deceit and treachery, why should I continue to live? This was his statement. Then he says, after listening to all I have said, if you still ask me to end my fast, I will end it. Afterwards, I shall go to Pakistan and make the Muslim, try to make the Muslims understand their folly. Whatever happens in other places, people in Delhi should re remain, uh, maintain peace. Then he said, the refugees should realize the Muslim refugees in Pakistan are suffering acute hardship and so are the Hindu refugees here. And then he asked people from both sides to return home. His main point was, this is your home. Whichever is your home, you must remain there. You must not force people to leave their home. Anyway, Maulana Azad then made some statements, Rajendra Prashad made statements, and the fast was uh, called off. And also the, the High Commissioner of Pakistan. High Commissioner of Pakistan was also there, Zahid Hussain. Zahid Hussain, he addressed a few words. He said the deep concern of the Pakistani people was conveyed to him, uh, and many other people. Anyway, I, want, I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, I want to get to the final part of this. Uh, which is that uh, the fast was ended on the 18th of January. On the 20th of the January, a bomb exploded in, in, in his Pravachan Sabha and uh, 10 days later he was dead. Now, uh, the whole issue of Gandhi's assassination and how it came about, it's a very, very big issue and very complex issue. Uh, but nonetheless, we must say a few things that this was a communal crime. It was a crime committed in communal hatred. That after he had achieved all these things in Noakhali, in Bihar, uh, in, in Delhi, and despite all this, uh, he was still hated by a certain section of the people. There is no doubt that Gandhi was a very contentious figure. There is no point denying that. Uh, he was always arguing with his own people. Of course, he would try to argue in very, very gentle language, but he would say things which made people very uncomfortable. All right. uh, he's always being accused of being an appeaser of Muslims. Actually, he could talk in a very, very sharp way to Muslims, Sikhs and Hindus also. You know, he, he, he was not a man to mince his words, although he would do it very gently. Nonetheless, if something kept him afloat, it was the capacity of ordinary people to maintain love and respect for one another in the most in the most awful circumstances. That is why I say often that he is a philosopher of the quotidian, of small things. He is a person who derived his strength 
from very small incidents of life. For instance, once there was a Hindu and Muslim, Hindu woman and a Muslim woman from Punjab who had been deprived of their families. The Hindu woman had lost her son and daughter-in-law, but she had two grandchildren. And the Muslim woman had lost all her family, but she was very close to this Hindu woman. They were, they were like sisters. And they came from Punjab just to see him. And they had to stay for many days because he was so busy. And finally he, he met and they said, we have only come <coughs> to take Ashirwad from this man. And they said, we have planned to bring up these children uh, as our collective children. And he met them and he was very, very pleased. And he said, this is, uh, for me, this is what communal harmony means. Anyway, after that was over, uh, I won't go into the details. Uh, the fact is that he was shot dead at point blank range uh, by Nathuram Godse on the, on the 30th of January. Uh, one American uh, 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 journalist who was present on the scene is reported to have said, and I have learned this from Makran Paranjpe's book on Gandhi's uh, assassination. One American reporter who was present said that I could feel that he had left me. He said, there's no other way I can describe what happened after that shot was fired. He left me. So obviously there was some kind of aura. We don't have to be religious or spiritual, but the fact is that uh, his death caused a palpable feeling in the people who were present over there. Now, soon after that, many, many things began to happen and uh, the whole world was affected by this. Uh, I will just mention in brief, I mean, before I read the tributes to him, I'll say that uh, there's been a lot of controversy and the controversy is continuing. One reason why the controversy regarding the involvement of RSS and Hindu Mahasabha is continuing is because this Sangh Parivar simultaneously takes pride in the death of Mahatma Gandhi. At the same time, it wishes to deny the involvement, their own involvement. So this is of course very treacherous ground, nowadays people are going to the Supreme Court and saying all kinds of things, but let us be clear, soon after the uh, election of uh, the Modi government, there was a spur, there was a spate of incidents in which people belonging to the Sangh Parivar had begun to praise Godse. There were even attempts to, be, to build uh, you know, temples to Godse. These are some titles, there are some titles of newspaper headlines that I am reading out to you. Sakshi Maharaj reveals BJP's long-standing tie to Nathuram Godse. Godse should have killed Nehru, says Kesari editorial. Hindu Mahasabha head speaks, speaks, Godse was a martyr and a patriot. Hindu Mahasabha to build Godse temple. Site identified in Lucknow for Godse temple. Hindu Mahasabha performs Bhumi Pujan for Godse temple, etc, etc. This was happening. Nowadays it has stopped, but it was happening just a year or two ago. So obviously it is tactical. All right, it has been it has been stopped. Curb. But the fact is that there is a section of opinion among those who call themselves followers of Savarkar who take pride in this. And Savarkar's involvement in the case was undoubted. Uh, as I said, there's no time to go into all the details of this, but Savarkar was a prime accused in the Gandhi murder case. He was a prime accused. He was let off on a technicality. There was a, years later when Savarkar was, you know, those days people would spend only 14 years for, for, for murder. So the people who went to jail for the murder, two people were hanged. But the people who went to jail for the murder, they were released after 14 years and they had a celebration in Pune in which Savarkar was also present. And that was the time when there was an opinion in the country that how dare these people do this. They have killed Mahatma Gandhi and now they are celebrating. And then there was a Jeevan Lal Kapoor that was a sitting uh, Supreme Court Justice who was asked to investigate. He came out with a report called the Jeevan Lal Kapoor Commission of Inquiry into the Assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. The text of that is published by the Home Ministry of India, but it took a long time for some of us to even acquire that book. It is a public document of the Government of India. It took a very hard time to get hold of the book. It is now up on the web. You can, uh, you can read it easily, but it is difficult. And in that you can see that although there is no direct connection established with the RSS. The, 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 whole, the, the atmosphere of communal hatred built up by the Hindu nationalist organizations against Mahatma Gandhi was very clear, right from the 1930s onwards. I mean, there were five attempts to murder him, right? 
So we must be clear that it is something to do, it was, a, it was an act of communal hatred, the killing of Gandhi. And uh, the statement issued on February the 4th, 1948 by the government of India, the press communique in which they banned the RSS, it, it states very clearly that the, 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 the acts of violence uh, and, and robbery, dacoity and murder were being carried out in the cloak of secrecy. The Sangh was exhorting people to resort to terrorist methods, etc., etc. So these are all statements made by the government of India. And obviously, Sardar Patel was involved in them, no matter now that the Sangh Parivar is trying to own Sardar Patel. But Sardar Patel actually presided over issuing this, uh, this ban order on the RSS. Anyway, and they, uh, this statement also said that the cult of violence sponsored and inspired by the activities of the Sangh has claimed many victims and the most precious to fall was Gandhiji himself. But aside from this, one must go further. And uh, here is Sardar Patel's statement on in 1948. Again, this is available. It's a public document. There the selected correspondence of Sardar Patel in uh, volume 6 in which he says, as regards the case regarding RSS and Hindu Mahasabha, the case relating to Gandhiji's murder is sub uh, I should not like to say anything about the participation of these organizations, but our reports do confirm that as a result of the activities of these two bodies, particularly the former, an atmosphere was created in the country in which such a ghastly tragedy became possible. Then he's, he says the activities of the RSS constituted a clear threat to the existence of government and the state. Our, our reports show that these activities, despite the ban, have not died down. Furthermore, he said in a letter he, which he wrote to Jawaharlal Nehru on, the, on the, uh, February the 27, 1948, he said that it is the fanatical wing of the Hindu Mahasabha directly under Savarkar that hatched the conspiracy and saw it through. So here is Sardar Patel saying, even though it's sub judice, he's saying it in a private letter to Jawaharlal Nehru, which is available in a public domain that it is V.D. Uh, 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 Savarkar who was responsible for this conspiracy. And the people who were the murderers of Gandhi were in touch with V.D. Savarkar both before uh, the murder and in the interim period between the 20th and the 30th. They had gone back uh, to Bombay and met Savarkar and Savarkar apparently sent them away saying that this time it should be successful. So, I don't think there was any doubt in Sardar Patel's mind and the documents are available as I said, volume 6 of uh, Patel's selected correspondence makes it clear. But it's very interesting that regarding, all the, the, regarding the involvement of the RSS in this, he said in the same letter reflecting on the problem of identifying RSS members, he wrote, in the case of secret organization like the RSS which has no records of membership, no registers, etc., Securing of authentic information whether a person is an active member or not is a very difficult task. This is very clear that there are, after all, people who are going to commit, commit a criminal act are not necessarily going to give a minuted record that this is what we are going to do. This is very unlikely. So they will, in the, the first aim of a criminal act is to do the act and the second most important aim of the criminal act is to get away with it. All right. Uh, so this this kind of reticence was not shown by, by the, the, the brothers of Gorse. And Gopal Gorse stated that uh, any attempt to deny the RSS involvement was actually sheer cowardice. He said uh, in, a, in a book, Why I Assassinated Mahatma Gandhi, Gopal Gorse spoke on the occasion of the release of this book and he said all, of, all the brothers were in the RSS, Nathuram, Dattareya and myself and Govind. You can say we grew up in the RSS, it, then, it was like our home, like a family to us. And regarding Advani's claim, L.K. Advani's claim that Nathuram had nothing to do with the RSS, uh, Gopal Gorse said, I have counted him. If it is impossible to say that they ordered it, it's equally impossible to say that they did not order it. This is a matter for historical speculation. It's not a matter, RSS is not in court. We are not charging them. They are not going to be punished by us or by anybody. It's a matter of public opinion. And therefore, we should know, the. we should weigh and balance the evidence and see what it is that uh, led to the, the murder of um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Whatever it is, it's, it's a complex issue, an entirely <coughs> different talk uh, may be uh, appropriate for that. Let me just end with some of the tributes that were paid to Gandhi. As I said, uh, the title of my talk is Love at Work. And you can see from what I have described that Gandhi's entire effort then was to control the flames of hatred by love. 
In fact, even his attitude to the Muslim League was different from the attitude of the Congress. For them, that it was a party to be defeated. For him, it was a group to be won over by love. That's what he was trying to do. Even when he went to Bihar, he, one of the first visits he made was to uh, Abdul Aziz, who was the leader of the Bihar Muslim League. And another person called, uh, I think, Nawab Ismail, he went and met them. And they were people who had been writing vitriolic letters, uh, you know, press notes against Gandhi. But he, was, he would go and sit with them and meet them. He would, never f f he would never stand on ceremony and say, you should visit me. He would go and visit people. All right? So his effort at the, in this whole period was to try to conquer by love. He used to say that I have to have heart unity, not the unity of the intellect, but of the heart. Diliya ekta. All right? Anyway. He died and uh, we all know what happened and I think we are still not able to come to terms with what has happened. Sometimes an event is so massive that we don't really acquire any sense of it until a very long time has passed. Uh, that is why maybe a big section of Indian public opinion, especially middle class opinion and educated opinion actually is very ill-educated about what Gandhi stood for in his last, especially his last days. Especially the kind of polemic tone I, I notice, where people cannot even, do not even have the grace to give him some credit for what he did. You know, you can criticize a man, but to, to rub him in the dust in the manner that many people have done in this country, this is, uh, it's a matter of great sadness for me. Anyway, I just read out to you a few things. The impact Gandhi had around the world, regardless of what people in India think or do not think. Here is Reverend Martin Luther King. Like most people, I had heard of Gandhi, but I had never studied him seriously. As I read, I became deeply fascinated by his campaign of non-violence. The whole concept of Satyagraha was profoundly significant for me. Gandhi was probably the first person in history to, to lift the love ethic of Jesus be, above mere interaction between individuals to a powerful and effective social force on a large scale. If humanity is to progress, Gandhi is inescapable. He lived, thought and acted by, inspired by the vision of humanity evolving towards a world of peace and harmony. We may ignore him at our own risk. Raju Gopalachari, Governor General. Uh, no one could die a more glorious death than Mahatma Gandhi. He was going to the seat of his prayer to speak to his Ram. He did not die in bed calling for hot water, doctors and nurses. He died standing, not even sitting down. Ram was too eager to take him before he could even reach the seat of prayer. When Socrates died for his views and Christ for his faith, they believed that they would not get another example like that. Romel Roland, Gandhi is, is not only for India a hero of national history. Gandhi has renewed for all the peoples of the West the message of their Christ forgotten and betrayed. I have seen it here in Switzerland, the pious love that he inspired in humble peasants of the country of the countryside in the mountains. Mia Iftikharuddin, President of the West Punjab Muslim League, who was a peasant leader, uh, a left-wing peasant leader. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi's death ends an epoch of Indian history, of which he was the originator. Each one of us who has raised his hand against innocent men, women and children during the past months, who has publicly or secretly entertained sympathy for such acts, is a collaborator in the murder of Mahatma Gandhi. Jawaharlal Nehru, he spread out all over India, not only in palaces and select places, but in every hamlet of the lowly and the poor and those who suffer. He lives in the heart of millions. I won't read more about him. Fazlul Haq. The assassination of Mahatma Gandhi is one of the most tragic events since the great tragedy of Karbala. It is impossible to find words to express, express the feelings that are uppermost in our minds. Will Durant. Not since Buddha has, has India revered any man. Uh, has India so revered any man? Not since St. Francis of Assisi has any life known to history been so marked by gentleness, disinterestedness, simplicity of soul and forgiveness. We have the astonishing phenomenon of a revolution led by a saint. Sardar Patel, his supreme sacrifice will, will quicken our conscience. Gandhi's imperishable teachings will abide with us. I feel that his immortal spirit is still hovering over us. The mad youth who killed him was wrong if he thought that thereby he was destroying his noble mission. Perhaps God wanted Gandhiji's mission to fulfill and prosper through his death. Maulana Abdul Kalam Azad, 
Mahatma Gandhi has carried on his frail shoulders a great deal of the burden of humanity and it is now for them to stand together and share it. Sarojini Naidu It was right that the cremation took place in the midst of dead kings who were buried in Delhi for the, he was the kingliest of all kings. It was right that he who was the apostle of peace should have been led, taken to the cremation ground with all the honours of a, of a great warrior. Far greater than all warriors who led armies to battle was this little man. Muhammad Ali Jinnah I associate myself with the tributes that have been paid to this great man. He died in the discharge of his duty in which he believed. His tragic death, however much we may deplore it, was a noble death. <coughs> for he died in the discharge of his duty. Hussein Shahid Surawardi, who was the Premier of Bengal at the time when the massacre took place. To him we had to turn for guidance and for advice in all our difficulties and he never failed us. Weep India, weep until thy heart breaks, for extinguished is the light of truth and justice, a deep love for humanity and transcendental sympathy for the forlorn and the friendless. I am sure he sees what we, what we do. Let us try to fulfill his cherished dream. Who is this? This is uh, Hussein Shahid Surawardi, ex-premier of, he became, he became Prime Minister of Pakistan later on, uh, only for a year. Resolution passed by Jamiat ulama e hind it was Mahatma Gandhi who practicing truth, patience, perseverance, forbearance and tolerance conducted the nation's peaceful and non-violent struggle for freedom. He was an ardent supporter and upholder of democracy, fraternity and Hindu-Muslim unity. The working committee appreciates his grand and unparalleled services of the Mahatma to the country as a whole and regards him as the greatest benefactor of India. Abdul Ghaffar Khan, he was the only ray of light to help us through these darkest days. General Douglas MacArthur, nothing more revolting has occurred in the history of modern world than the senseless assassination of this venerable man. That he should die by violence is one of the, those bitter anachronisms that seems to refute all logic. In the evolution of civilization, if it is to survive, all men cannot fail eventually to adopt his belief that the process of mass application of force to resolve contentious issues is not only wrong, but contains the germs of self-destruction. Gandhiji was one of those prophets who lived far ahead of his times. Douglas MacArthur. Rajkumari Amrit Kaur, it is impossible to estimate his loss at this critical juncture in our history. Anyway, I won't go into more into that. Sheikh Abdullah, although Gandhiji is no more, Kashmir will follow him forever. Sri Sankaracharya of uh, Kamakoti Peet, a more perfect ideal of ahimsa and love cannot be conceived. Gandhi utilized every evil happening to test his inner purity. Albert Einstein, everyone concerned in the in the better future of mankind must be deeply moved by the tragic death of Mahatma Gandhi. He died as a victim of his own principles, the principle of non-violence. He refused armed protection for himself. It is his unshakable belief that for use of force is an evil in itself. The admiration for Gandhi and Mahatma Gandhi in all countries of the world rests on recognition, mostly subconscious recognition, of the fact that in our time of utter moral decadence, he was the only statesman to stand for a higher level of human relationship in the political sphere. A leader of his people, a politician whose success rests not upon craft or mastery of technical devices, on the simple convincing power of his personality, a victorious fighter who has always scorned the use of force, a man of wisdom and humility, armed with resolve and inflexible consistency who has devoted his life, his, all his strength to the uplifting of his people, a man who has confronted the brutality of Europe with the dignity of the simple human being and thus at all times given risen superior. Generations to come, it may be, will scarcely believe that such a one as this ever in flesh and blood war upon this earth. Finally, the Hindustan standard of January 31st, 1948, issued just a one-page black front cover. The whole page was black and in it was inscribed in white. Gandhiji has been killed by his own people for whose redemption he lived. This second crucifixion in the history of the world has been enacted on a Friday. The same day Jesus was done to death 1915 years ago. Father forgive us. That's all.